I wrote my wrote this book with a friend. So um, similar, which I feel like a couple of us have talked about writing and what the journey has looked like for different people. I have always, I don't want to say that I was going to write books, but I feel like I've always just said, oh yeah, I'm going to write books. I'm going to dedicate this book, to, or I'm going to dedicate a book to you, like just special special people in my life. Um, so I've always had scraps of books started here and there, um, and a few years ago started really buckling down to write more consistently. Um, I actually was at a university class, long random story short. Um, I was at a university out in Seattle, and I was in my friend's class, and the professor was talking about dreaming, and what are the things in life you want to do, and he said, oh, you want to be a writer? And I was like, oh yeah, that is me, he's talking to me. And he literally, I mean, I didn't raise my hand, thank goodness, because he he was like, well, where's the blood trail? Like, where, where's like kind of the action behind the words? It's so easy for you to say, like, I want to do this, and not do any steps toward it. And I, that was what I feel like was a very defining moment in my life. Um, it, yeah, brought me to this place of conviction of like every day, or consistently. Sometimes in some season it hasn't been every day but consistently just putting some action to that dream. So sometimes it's been once a week, writing for a few hours. Right now I'm able to write every day for a few hours. Um, I'm probably going to give you some more rabbit trails tonight. So this particular book came about with my friend Lindsay. Um, she was giving birth to her first child in South Africa, and she texted me and said, we should write a book, right? I don't think she actually texted me actually in labor, but kind of in that season of like, she was about to give birth, or she had just had her newborn, and, and said, we should write a book. And I texted back and said, yes, of course, we should write that book. We kind of joked about it for years. Um, so how many of you guys have used Google Docs at all? Google, Google Docs, so it's, you can, it's an online, we did not do that. We, we did not make a plot line. We did not make an outline or any part of the story. We did not make a character list. All the things you're supposed to do right. when you write a book, we did not do any of them. In fact, I'm supposed to do a, a talk at the library in the fall, and we're trying to title it something like how to not write a novel. Um, so we're trying to make a clever way to say it, but just I did it. We did it all the wrong ways, and we laugh at ourselves now. But um, it was basically like... I'm, I'm gonna forget the name of it. Telephone is that the game where if I look at Diane and I say yes, oh no no no, it's not telephone. It's if I say the man went out to the street today, and then Diane says and he saw a red ball, and then Adam says and the ball had a weird logo on it, and then Mandy says it was a circle logo. Like that, <laughs> you, you've you've played that game right with yeah. good people. So that's how we wrote the book. Again, no direction. Um, so books typically. Let's say give or take it would be about eighty-five thousand words. We got to about forty thousand words, had finished the book, and looked at each other and said, "Okay, now what? This, the story, the story is finished. We have half the. It was like this is about forty thousand words. We have half the amount we're supposed to do, and it was terrible." I said, "This can never be the light of day, Lindsay. Never, ever, ever." So we actually put it on the back burner again. She was in South Africa, had a newborn. Um, ended up moving to the States, ended up moving somewhere else in the States, and she eventually came back around a few years later and said, no, we have to finish it. And I was like, it's terrible. We cannot finish this book. And she's just one of those people who's like, no, we can do it. It's going to be awesome. It's the best book ever. And I was like, are we reading the same book? It's awful. Like, I can't even let my mom read this book. Um, but we, from that point, she eventually won me over, and we spent the next two years really workshopping it and getting it to something that felt like, okay, it's a complete story now, it's something um, that stands on its own, that isn't terrible, <laughs> and yes, so that is how we wrote the book. As I mentioned, we went with a small independent publisher for this one, and uh, we did not have an agent, but going forward I am looking for an agent, so that's like instead of me going to publishers and saying, here's my book, will you take it? It's a middle person doing it for me and advocating for me. And I feel like I really crave working with someone who can do that and also who can read this and say, hey, let's change these hundred things. Like, it can be stronger, it can be better. I know that there's a bit of that that comes with editing, but if you have certain agents also do that, depending mm -hmm. on, like, the personality type. And I feel like I 
How many of you are artists in here? I know, like, yes. artists, or like, right? <laughs> I feel like I, I crave, perfection isn't the right word, but I like knowing I'm putting something out in the world that's the best I have in me. And so I don't mind, I'm, I feel very um, open to being told, hey, let's, being challenged and saying, hey, I feel like you can write this part better. I feel like it can be stronger. I feel like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's go back and take this section of the book to the drawing board. So I feel very open to that and I crave that. Like that's what I would prefer rather than someone saying, oh, it's good enough. Like it's going to sell as is. So let's not put the work into it. Let's just get it out there because, you know, we want to sell and make the bottom line. So, um, do you, I'm going to let you guys ask questions. Would you prefer me reading a section and then you asking questions? Or read a section because yeah. we really don't know what it is yet. Okay, I should. I'll tell you the summary okay. as well. So that's a great Ken. Sorry, Ray me and Ken. Um, we our original version, which had no plot, storyline, etc. It was actually just this random love triangle, and that wasn't what we wanted. It wasn't what we were trying to say, we just didn't know how to say what we were trying to say, and as we were reading through kind of the pages we did have, we realized, oh, the story is actually about the Hamilton family. So the story opens with the mom, who's been gone for 13 years, showing up on the front doorstep because she learned that her former husband has cancer. So also they have, they have two kids two twins, and they also are like there because they found out the dad had cancer. So they're all in the same place for the first time in 13 years. How did the story begin initially? That's a great question. I think it initially began, so we actually both have both of our first passages still in the book. Um, it initially, that's the right verse. It was very different. It was very different. My first section was an encounter on a bus between the daughter her name is Reese, and a friend of her, or like the guy who became a friend of hers um, in Ireland. So that was my first section. So again, kind of, we ended with this really strong theme of a love, love triangle, which was um, not the full message that we wanted to say. So we actually worked really hard on looking at themes around forgiveness and what does reconciliation look like? What does reconciliation and forgiveness look like? when someone has actually harmed you, you know, like this mom left for, for, and she's been gone for 13 years, so like, what does that look like? But not doing it in a preachy way, so it was like a weird... story or fiction? No, it is entirely fiction. Um, about 2% maybe random pieces are like, oh, that is like a little yeah. piece of our family, let's incorporate that, or like, oh, my mom always says that, that's cute, let's add that in. Um, I just want to just want to jump in there. Yeah, just, please. Just back to that at the beginning. Because one of the things at the symposium that I learned was that all like it's all about questioning yourself. Okay, who's the best? You know the story, but which character would tell the story the best? From which perspective? Right. And does the story begin where you think it begins? Yes. Because and I thought that was something I've never thought about before. When you're writing, you start to write, but if once you write a lot, that's when you start to see actually. The story started here to get to here, not here to get yes. to here, right? And then, yes. so your point of, that's why I was fascinated by that mm -hmm. change where it started from, because I, I thought it was a really interesting thing to learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I will say that um, to that point, the only time Lindsay and I have actually ever been in the same place in the last seven years, one was at a wedding, but the, the only time we were working on the book was a four-day weekend when I went to Omaha, which is where she currently lives. And during, we were reading the book out loud to kind of see what we needed to change, etc. And during a section I was reading out loud, she just started yelling, boring. From across <laughs> the room, she's like, boring, boring, this is boring. And after that, we actually ended up delete, deleting the, the first third of the book as well as the last third of the book. Oh. So again, we'd finally gotten up to like 90,000 words, we were so excited, and then like slash everything, and just again, kind of getting back and back and back and back to that core, what is the story about? Like, what are we saying? Is this passage moving the story forward? The famous Stephen King line, kill your darlings. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so painful, so painful, but so good. Um, an author, um, friend of mine, 
that's a, a, something similar. She told me that change. I feel like it also changed my writing. She she said you can never grow so attached to even one line because it can wreck your book if you're not willing to give it up if it's a line that's not supposed to be in your book. And so a similar thing where even if it's like the most beautifully written piece of art you've ever put together, if it's not making your book stronger or not supposed to be there, then you have to be able to be willing to take it out. I know, it's, a, it's very painful. Um, and also to Adam's point, so this is written, so it follows the Hamiltons over the next two months as they're all together for the first time in 13 years. And it's the mom, Bernice, and the daughter, Reese, telling the story. So it goes back and forth between the two. At one point, we had every single character telling the story. Um, so we had the dad, the brother, and again, to Ken's point, we actually loved the brother as a voice. Like, he was one of our favorite voices, but it wasn't making this strong, the story stronger, what he was actually saying. He was funny, but he wasn't adding anything to it. His sections were short, choppy, and some feedback we got was that, no, you weren't feeling attached to any characters because you just kind of were like hopping from person to person through the, through the telling. And so we actually, until last summer, had Blake, the, the guy from Ireland, as a narrator as well. And our editor, right before it went to publish, said, you can take this or leave this, but I think you need to drop his voice because really this, at the end of the day, is a story about two strong women, the dynamics between them and the, you know, the unforgiveness between them and the history between them. Um, and so that was a really hard edit because as soon as we read it, we knew she was right. But we, again, liked so many of the things that he brought to the table and felt like he was able from a member, like from someone outside of the family to kind of speak into the family from an observer, but ultimately it wasn't making the book stronger. So I did cut him out, guys. It was so painful. <laughs> so I think we cut another like 10,000 words right before. So what did he make the book strong? What did he say? Oh, gosh. <laughs> What's your name? Stephanie Ann. Ah, Stephanie Ann. Stephanie. Stephanie. Hi, Sorry, Stephanie. I don't have much voice right now. No, it's me. That's why I went on Facebook a year ago, because I couldn't talk. <laughs> so I thought, okay, Dad, I'll go on Facebook. I've never been on it in my life. Yeah. I've been busy. Yeah. But mm. I think I will answer, and then Ken should answer. Remember, I'm the person who was like, didn't know what they were doing and started <laughs> writing. Um, so I think for me, something... What did because you we do, what we, did you learn? Were the essential yeah, things we, we learned because it we did this strong. What, in what the backwards it? way <laughs> did literally every single thing wrong. Like every single thing wrong. Um, I think I really learned the art of taking out extra words and extra sentences. I think that's something that I not. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it by any means, but I feel like that's something we. I kept going, coming back to the drawing board and saying, oh, we essentially said that same thing two sentences ago. We don't need it again here. Um, looking at every single passage and saying, what is this contributing to the overall story? Is it just like a funny moment? But is it is it showing some moment where the family's connecting? Is it just a funny moment for the sake of a funny moment? And is that okay? Or is it something just that's fluff and filler? And so, because I think we had a lot of those. <laughs> like, I think, mean, we definitely had a lot of those. Um, so I think those, that's probably one of the things I've been focusing on now as I'm writing, just making sure every single thing that's there has a purpose. So writing with a purpose. And I think Ken should say something. Why should I say something? Because you you like have some more expertise. Oh, you wish. <laughs> I'm just the president of the Writers Club. Just I, the president of the Writers Club. Yeah, I know, but it doesn't mean I actually finished any of my books yet. <laughs> I'm, I've got six books on the go, maybe more, nine books on the go. Wow. Only one of which is a novel, and it's the farthest from being done. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I'm with this group of people who write, and somehow somebody has to run the, the group because <laughs> because they're busy doing other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure you can think about it. If you have something you want to add, please feel free. Um, okay, so I will... I'll start, I'll read a little passage, and also I will say, starting the opening scene with the mom coming was not even our idea. Someone who read the book wrote back and said, why don't we, why isn't that the opening scene? And again, as soon as she said it, we were like, oh my gosh, 
of course, because that's strong. It draws people into the story, into the moment. Um, so it takes a village story to book people. Takes a village. <laughs> um, I will try to enunciate. I also kind of made a vow that I would never read this again because I've read it like a hundred times. <laughs> so this is the first time in months. <sighs> I'm a little nervous because <laughs> I felt like I would see so many things I wanted to change if I ever opened it up again. So, okay. Hi, so Reese. This is May, and Reese is marrying. Hi, sugar, she whispered, and I blacked out, standing straight up as her pink mouth moved and the wind raged and my heart crept along its edges. I should have slammed the door in her face, yelled profanities at the closed structure afterwards, but instead I stood frozen, arms suspended above the handle. I hate her. I took a taxi, well, a plane first. I came to help, you know. Her hair lay in drenched strands plastered around her face. Black lines streaked down each of her cheeks. She was backlit by the porch by the rain. My head tingled along the top, and I shuddered. It was 10 p.m. exactly. I remembered seeing the green numbers on the microwave as I scooted confused through the kitchen to answer the insistent doorbell less than a minute before. Can I, her voice squeaked, can I come in? Still I stared, the seconds taught between us, all ability to form syllables lost along the 13 years since we'd last been in this place together. There was movement at her side, and a furry barking head poked itself from her fuchsia purse and into the porch lit night. She tugged the chihuahua out with ringed fingers and shoved the offensive creature toward my face. This is Rocky. He can help too. As I opened my mouth, finally finding my words, there was a pressure on my elbow where Ben had presented himself. You need to get out of the rain. He reached for two of her three large suitcases as he glanced at me. We shot each other telepathic messages until he shrugged and widened the door, inviting her inside with a wave. As they disappeared into the house behind me, I walked out into the rain and sat on the wet porch as if I could float away on the sea of the storm. I'd spent the entire eight-hour plane ride back to Omaha drinking mimosas one after the other like it was a cheap game, wondering how I could fix the chaos that was my life. I'd been back now for a few days, but hadn't yet found the answers I so desperately needed. Tell me again how you found out Dad was sick? It was easiest to direct my anger at my 25-year-old twin. The oppressive green walls of our ch childhood kitchen had not faded with time, and I sat, on the scratched, I sat at the scratched oak table with Ben, pestering him for information once again. This had become a ritual since I barreled into town the previous week, but his explanations never seemed to satisfy. Reese, we've been through this. I found a dozen pill bottles in his medicine cabinet. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out something was up. My brother leaned back in his chair and exhaled. His espresso colored hair stuck up at divergent angles, a sea of exclamation marks. But why were you going through his medicine cabinet in the first place? He tapped out a bead on the table in front of him and smiled. Would you rather me tell you I needed a band-aid or are you okay with the fact I always go through people's cabinets when I visit? You count moving back in with dad for two whole months as a visit. Don't nitpick my terminology, sister. Your 20 questions are almost up, and then it's my turn. I have some questions for you about Charlie. Behind black frames, his dark eyes were infuriatingly calm. We'd looked at each other like this so many times through the years, his eyes as familiar to me as my own, a prolonged stare full of unspoken questions and an overarching overstanding, the mountain of unsaid things between us prodigious and daunting. I sighed and shook my head. Ben, don't be lame, this is serious. Okay, actually, I'll save this book fine. Let's recap for the upteenth time. My company is starting a branch here in Omaha. You do remember I work for a big deal marketing firm? I will not deign to answer such ridiculous queries. I punched his arm. Right, well, said big deal marketing firm sent me over to little old Omaha to be the project manager for our latest plant since I'm a native and know the vibe. Maya came with me for the first week because we hadn't been up, since, we hadn't been up to see dad since Christmas and we like to come a, come a couple of times a year anyway. You know, like kids do. Don't. Just don't. So here we are. Here also were the pills and a little thing called cancer that Dad had hidden from all of us. I called you right away. Anyway, he's only supposed to have a couple more rounds of treatments. I knew even though a determined click of heels and the scent of wisteria presented themselves behind me. It had been two days since Bernice, formerly known as Mom, showed up like an apparition, more like a nightmare in the night. The last two days had witnessed a dance of avoidance between us. The day before, she'd waited outside the bathroom for me, and even at seven in the morning, her slightly chubby five foot two inch frame was bejeweled from head to toe. Her blonde bob was quaffed into big curls, tightly sprayed. She gave me a hesitant glance, and I tripped down the hallway in my hurry to escape. I only want to help, her hopeful yells chased me to my room as a round sound. Her, vision, her version of being helpful was to give, to give 
press each worry flicks in turn and spend hours in the kitchen concocting a variety of casseroles, soups, and hams. She was from Mississippi and her love language is of the greasy variety. Why is she here? I'm off the bin. I'm off the bin. It was the first time, thanks for that. <laughs> Why is she here? I'm off the bin. It was the first time she'd come back since she'd walked out without a goodbye all those years ago. He shrugged. We didn't invite Bernice. Didn't expect to see her, but I wasn't accounting for her strength of personality, her need to be at the center of any drama. Lord no, she loves to be needed. As she ran toward Ben with a weepy look and open arms, I left. I ignored Dad's prone figure on the couch and headed outdoors. Okay. Mm. Thanks for listening. I feel like this. The book is mm. three parts. So the first part is there in Omaha. The second part is them on the road trip. And then the third part is oh, after. Is after. So the family <laughs> sort of rebuilds after having this 13-year um, break. Ish. And I think ish. Yeah. some people kind of forgive and move on, some people don't forgive. Okay. Um, because I think, and we've had some controversial feedback from people who were like, I don't like, like our ending, our last third is, or maybe just the ending. There's people who don't like it, which is, I think we wrote it knowing that we're gonna create some enemies. <laughs> um, but we felt like this is what happened, this is the choice, these are the choices that are being made. Um, it's the, it's the, our characters choosing them, guys, not us. Um, but also, even that idea of like rebuilding the family, I like it. I think it's like very, maybe the goal and maybe really beautiful and forgiveness is, but I think it's not always that neat and tidy, and not everyone can get on board with saying, like, yeah, let's just move forward together. So some people forgive, some people don't. What made you call it Remember Me? What made you call it Remember Me? Why did it, there is a line in there that says Remember Me. That was just it. Um, I feel like maybe we we threw a bunch of names out on the table, like the long way home, something about trying to. It's also like maybe somebody's death that you want to be remembered in more. Yeah, more. just trying to think through like they're all home for the first time. So like, right. what is that? I I just made a comment, and I haven't read the book yet, so this yeah. is only. Just off the top, and so you stay there for what it's worth. But to me, remember me speaks neediness. Remember us, though. Remember us. Okay. Neediness. Remember us. Help. <laughs> Help. We're out here. And what I've experienced with people yep. is whenever they sense neediness, they run the other direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so our human race just seems to be mm -hmm. that way. And so I might suggest that you might want to take a real look at that and because it would seem that a lot is a lot of marketing of a book goes on the title like it catches mm -hmm. attention right makes mm -hmm. the person want to read it like mm -hmm. you know one flew over the cuckoo's nest just kind of puffs out <laughs> you know dire mm -hmm. matters or maybe things are a little off the wall catchy mm -hmm. yeah something mm -hmm. promising or something you know mm -hmm. that's, that's just you said you wanted feedback Oh, perfect. You'll get honest feedback with me. <laughs> get honest to where I'm at. Yeah. I mean, but this is your first book and you've moved on, right? It is my first book. I had a friend who's a writer tell me that everyone's first book is crap. And I feel like that gave me a lot of hope. <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, all right, so no matter what, like it's doomed, doomed to be crap. That's a great and I can just out. like, but then I've written it, I can write great things after this. So I don't, I do not think it's crap. It is no. not, I don't think it's fully it's representative so of the kind of writer that I am at my core, but it also was a team project, so I did it with someone else. So I think it wasn't just my voice. Yeah, that's a stretch too. So we again we learned so many things from yeah. doing something together. It was a bit like a group project mm -hmm. in high school, which we all probably remember, even though it's a long time ago. <laughs> I, I, I I get another impression from that title though, I, and the fact that you use two different colors it matches the BW, but I think it's. It's two different things. It's not the remember us and we, you know, have pity for us. I think it's remember us. We're mm -hmm. together. We are a group. So it's us. We're doing the remembering about who we are, maybe who we were as a family 13 years ago. So it's kind of remember, this is us kind mm -hmm. of thing. Not like this is us like the show. That's Which is also very good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Adam's but, perspective is exactly how I took it. Okay. And the yeah. visual in part yeah. puts that into my yeah. mind too. Exactly. Remember us. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. She put a few flowers on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be me. <laughs> yeah. I'd have a fan made of flowers. <laughs> Make it be that be. Not some old guy dying of cancer. He doesn't have a fan of flowers on it. <laughs> but it is odd that there's no people. There aren't any people. It's oh just yeah, the bus. just the empty bus. Yeah. So that makes me also feel the deaths in the story. So who side. picked the co who picked the cover? What sort of a what sort of a publisher are you working with? Are you working with one who who's doing what you tell them to do and making you pay them money, or are you working with one who's who's paying all the freight and telling you what to do? Both. <laughs> so we did. We wanted to go with. There's so many publishing options. We didn't yeah. want one that we had to pay because we felt like. Mm. If we were paying, we might as well self-publish. We had friends who'd like self-publish on Amazon and love the experience and have it complete autonomy and you get the most money that way for sure. Um, but we, because I am, kind of have a big, my bigger vision is wanting to kind of get into the mm -hmm. book writing market a little bit more. I didn't want to self-publish my first book, even though there's nothing wrong with it. A huge book, like The Martian, was apparently self-published. So like book, you know, and that's like this blockbuster they movie. It can be republished. Yeah, yeah. Um, so our publisher did actually do um, a cover for us, but we actually, long story short, but Lindsay's husband at the time had designed this because we wanted it for marketing before we even went to press or anything. Um, and then we ended up swapping out the, the cover that the publisher had made for this one and so they and they let us do that um mm. so yeah they they say they want their authors to have a lot of autonomy and be able to choose yeah the other book tell us about the other book yeah. the other book is called is the title you can tell me what you think is we were all drawing um and that is not again like i've I made the title up. I hope the key. I pardon. I hope the key word was more. We were all drowning. Yes. Um, it's I call it my dark book, but I, it might be the book that I'm the most passionate about, and I also haven't honed my like two minute elevator message. Mm -hmm. Sorry guys. Um, so I say it's a novel that I wrote about things I I know about. So religion in the south, and I say religion as opposed to like faith, and that's like a whole thing. But religion in the south, um, sisters and abuse. So I'm actually originally from Kentucky, and so I have this like very soft spot spot in my heart around Southern culture. Like I'm very I'm from near Nashville. Like Nashville is where I fly into if I fly home. My family's still there. I don't have the Southern accent, and it's a shame. We do not know why. We don't know what happened. <laughs> um, I think it's so charming. But so yeah, that is what it's about. Yeah, so it's, mm -hmm. it's this one's maybe a bit more. Reminds me of the uh, Margaret Atwood poem. Yeah. It starts out, this is a picture of me. It was taken the day after I drowned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then she describes the countryside. She's in the lake. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Yeah. And then I'm working on another book as well. Um, so Lindsay and I actually know each other from... We did volunteer work together for a few years, and we were on a team of 11 girls, and we traveled around, we traveled to like 12 countries together while we were on this team of 11 girls, so you can imagine, there's like a lot of fun things that happened, but, um, so we were originally gonna write that book together, and then long story short, um, I'm gonna write it. I'm kind of taking over the process, and just again, kind of, doing things as a group project is really beautiful in a lot of ways and so in a lot of ways a lot more work and I was like I can't commit to doing more work like I don't have the capacity to put this extra energy in like right now where I'm in life like I can write it by myself or you can write it but like I can't write it together so we're still in a, we're still on um get terms with each other like no hard feelings but it just I I felt like I have a kid, I have a husband, I'm working, like I can't, I couldn't do a group project. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for listening. Do you guys have any other questions? Um, I did. <laughs> Sorry, I give long answers. For, for both. Um, uh, I don't have a specific question on that. I did, I'm, I'm lost. 
Mm-hmm. I'm tired too. I, I did get I went to sleep at two last night. Oh, mm-hmm. It's the worst. <laughs> but, but I've been doing you said something before about not letting things go and that being I, I moved into a house about last July and and I had this dark blue wallpaper in the main living room. Everything else is yellow, but the mm-hmm. living room is and I, and I just said I, I gotta, I gotta make this room. I mean, I, I've, I've got to make it feel special. Yeah, and so I took oh, yeah. this project on two weeks ago, and it's like every little, the picture's there, is it? Mm-hmm. or if it's there, oh, there. Right, right. So I became very obsessive over on this in the last couple of weeks. And um, funny thing about obsession is it keeps you up, mm-hmm. which is good and bad, right? Mm-hmm. And so the same with the rec. When you're in, I mean, you you go and you can. But when it's a drag, you just like, oh, just turn on the TV and go to sleep. Or yeah. Yeah, sometimes I don't have the capacity. I've been in this yeah. weird energy for the last week or so with this project sort of going on at home that was, in the end, turned out to be very little subtle things, but I'm happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. That the idea of the trick is to become obsessed with sleeping. Yes. <laughs> I think that'll come naturally in a day or so. <laughs> Yeah, hoping, the weekend yeah. is here now. I'll go home mm-hmm. tonight. Literally, I'll take part of it. I'll just die. <laughs> mm, well, now see, I have a whole different uh, relationship to death because my dad's a funeral director, retired funeral director. Oh, yeah. you, you're so retired. I, you're he retired. Um, so I spent my youth of living above funeral homes. So it, um, which has got to be in more of my writing, but I, you know. It can't just be the Well, so back. far we've only heard, you know, little snatches. There's some pretty strong stuff in there, yeah. but nothing's nothing's come through as a whole yet. Well, you're only getting four pages of it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't been disciplined, so I've got to get, mm-hmm. because I've t- done this, I haven't done that, and I came home with all these great ideas, and I just sat and sit down one day, and that, that wasn't enough. Some right? ideas were sort of... Mm-hmm. I've been writing ever since the symposium. Wow. I've been writing thank you notes. Yes. <laughs> I've been writing, uh, you know, uh, critiques of what we can improve next time. <laughs> I know what I want to say. He's been writing of... messages, getting back after me, and mm-hmm. yeah. The topic of forgiveness. That's what uh, I was thinking yeah. about before. Which is, I think, like you, it sounds like you're dealing with it authentically in the sense that it's not like, oh, we all forgive each other, everything's great. Right. It sounds like you're dealing with that struggle, and it's, it's an interesting struggle. I'm going to give you two sort of examples. One, even today at work, a friend of mine moved in with two friends a couple of years ago, and they have split up in the most hateful way. Mm. One friend, two friends moved to Vancouver, but this other friend is still here, mm-hmm. and she's like, I wasted two years of my life, and they're so awful, and it was abuse, and I'm going into counseling, mm. and I'm good now. And I'm not, I'm angry, but I'm not blaming them. So mm-hmm. it's like, She's in this weird zone. She, she is getting to. She says, "I really want to get to complete forgiveness. I don't want this to be bothering the rest of me, the rest of my life. And I'm yeah. doing what I can to get there. But right now, mm-hmm. I'm still not there. Right. So that, But she knows that's where the she wants to be. Process often. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. And one other time, I, I I went to landmark education. My marriage broke up ten years ago, or longer now. I can't keep track of that. Eleven, twelve, eleven, thirteen. And um, at the time, it's like, well, and somehow the, oh, I was a manager of a staff member, and she had been when her father died. She mm. kept telling me about it, and it's like, that's ridiculous, stupid, 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 and her brother was telling us. And then, when everything fell apart, I was like, oh, maybe I can go try something. Mm. And so I went, and, and, and I went a little bit further in it, but... What I like is the first three days, and I would say stop there, although the, you're compelled to go on, but really that's the best part of the message in those three days. What is it you went to? It's called Landmark Education in Toronto. Okay. Right? What is yeah. it? What's the premise of it? Uh, the premise of it is um, if life is essentially meaningless, then what meaning do you want to get out of it? Mm-hmm. It's your choice. You always have a choice. What do you want? That's because right. you make it all up anyway. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and we are all going to die and all this, so mm -hmm. what do you want? And stop letting things block you and go do what you want to do and mm -hmm. get it because this is, you only have one life, so it's better mm -hmm. do what you want, right? Mm -hmm. but, Existentialism. Yeah, but it's many, they steal from not many different religions and theories and stuff and package it and make you feel the intensity. It used to be called EST, you probably heard of that EST seminar. It stands for? Er, his name, um, Earhart Seminar Training, I think. Oh, okay. And they bought the intellectual properties from him when he gave it up, and they called it, the staff bought it and called it landmark education, and yada, yada. But in there, there's a part, it's called a forum, because there's so many talk about a message, then you can come up and challenge, or you, and if you don't feel comfortable coming up, or if you don't feel comfortable asking questions, then the last part is turn around to the person beside you, talk about the issue. Hmm. And then we move on somewhere else, and at lunchtime, go have lunch with somebody, come back, sit with different people. And at dinner, go have lunch, and dinner, different. So over three days, you're having these intense conversations with strangers throughout the whole mm -hmm. time, right? But so to get to the one point, and then we talk about the racketeering in our minds and how we're all selfish anyway and all this, but, mm -hmm. you know, forgiveness comes up as a big thing there. And I remember somebody getting up and he says, okay, well, you want to challenge? Okay, come on, you cut. You, and, and the person says, well, here's the problem. I cannot forgive this person because he raped me and he did this and I'm, and he goes, oh yeah, and what did you have for dinner? Because it's just a thing. That's a thing. Hmm. That's a thing. You're, you still have to choose. And that person you're hating so much doesn't even, has died. Right. So now you're sitting here with all this anger, not hurting that person. Right. You're doing nothing but like keeping it yourself. in yourself. So what's it going to take for you to give it up? Yeah. Because if there's no other thing you can do or live with it for the rest of your life. So these are, they become very intense conversations at times. And so you're, and I wasn't really dealing, um, I messed up and forgiving my parents, neither one of them. My sister, okay. But my <laughs> parents, I'm still struggling. I might get that. Um, <laughs> I did say to my mother, I would go visit her mother, so she's happy about that. And I'm bringing fresh bagels, which they can't do so now. Um, but Are you angry? Are you angry? No. I'm going to place him. I know him or something. I'll stop talking, because if you're angry. But that, it sounds like you, you're forget what you said there when you said it didn't quite go. It sounds like those are the struggles. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I hope that's the struggles. Yeah, yeah, I think 100% you've nailed it on the head. And I think, to your point, families, most of us have some complicated dynamics in our family. Not everyone. Not everyone. Some people have. Yeah, and I think that I think that that is true. But I think that that's like a small percentage of people where, you know, they love to spend time with each other. It's without drama. It was without any history of kind of messy hurt. But I think for I'm most, family that doesn't have any drama. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I think most. I think that's why we kept pointing okay, around this message. Uh, pardon? I can't hear very well. Oh. Can't talk, can't hear. Yeah, sorry. I just have to talk to God and we'll be answered. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think in our experience, more times than not, people have complications within the family. And so that's something we felt like that's, a, that's um, kind of a theme that would resonate with everyone. Even if the, the Hamilton story isn't your story or your story, it's still... You have you might see pieces of your story, in in their story. Well, every family is a little dysfunctional. Yeah. However, I would say that I always feel more comfortable with my family than I do with the outside world, because they seem to be major dysfunctional. On the phone. Yeah. I find it really interesting that you did all this and you wrote with somebody else. And I can see that as a relief because all the weight is not on you to produce everything. Mm -hmm. But I can also see that being a struggle when you come to a point where you have a different idea of how something should be. Mm -hmm. How did you resolve the different idea? Yeah, I think it's exactly what you said where there were parts of it that were really fun where I would write something and to have someone who immediately wants to read it and loves the characters as much as I do or is invest, you know, even if I don't love them some, some days isn't as invested as I am in this family and knows them like I know my own family like there's she is the only other person in the world who is that intertwined with this family 
So I think that was like an upside. The downside was, yeah, sometimes not being able to be on the same page.